episode this morning. I have Con Murray, who is the chair of Treaty United Football Club. You'll know Con over the years and his voice from this show in many different guises, uh, but uh, this is one of them. And we also have Live 95 soccer correspondent Mike Hearn with me, and you're both very welcome. Good morning to you. Morning, Joe. And Good morning, Joe. The headline, Con, and there's a lot to it that we'll unpick, is that Treaty United Football Club is being taken over. Tell us more. Correct, uh, Joe. I'd like just to put it in a wee bit of context, I mean, we started uh, four seasons ago, uh, effectively, uh, with a view to bring back League of Ireland soccer back to Limerick and the Midwest. And it's had its challenges in the past, so it was something which we came together on the basis of how do we make this sustainable? How, how do we grow this so that it doesn't hit the walls that, that football often does? And we started off with a, with a not-for-profit approach, uh, in other words, that everything that we took into the club went into the club in terms of football. And our ambition was very clear. How do we create a platform for young people in the Midwest to maximise their potential in, in moving forward in sport and indeed in, in life itself? And with with a small group of people, um, with John Fennessy, Micah Hearn, Barry, Barry Hogan, uh, John, John Hannan, uh, Sean O'Brien and, and these Dave Mahidi, which was at the very start, uh, we came together, totally volunteers, it said to create that club. And we did. And we, like every other League of Ireland club in the country, recognised the challenges that is there in terms of keeping it up to the level that that's that. And I think even on this show, Joe, we talked about how do we plan for the future. And we said there'd be a five year horizon from the start. We're getting close to that now. And we felt as a, as a group, that this club could be more but it does require a level of investment and we were delighted that uh, we have met with with like thinking people in terms of the community of of the importance of of the the football um in this in this part of the world and they've come on board with us and they i believe will bring treaty to the levels that it that it should be who are these people okay i mean first first of all the the introduction came going back over a year ago when we were talking about our women's uh, football team and we needed to find a way of strengthening it. And we looked uh, as a consequence of a conversation with Kira McCormack and, and Maria Curtin actually about bringing a number of Canadian players across to give them an opportunity uh, to come across in, in, into Ireland itself. And that started a conversation. Uh, that went from there in terms, in fairness, to to my to John Fennessy, uh, who who said that there might be an opportunity of going further here, could be entered into a conversation, which I did do so then over a number of months. We signed a confidentiality agreement in NDA, go back last March, I think it is, Mike, and we, we, we discussed this at board level. So I was given the authority to go and discuss with, with representatives of, of the investors at that point in time. I didn't know who they were. We moved from there once the heads of terms had been agreed to direct conversations with the Tricor Pacific. Right, that would fascinate people. So you were talking to people, but at that point, you weren't sure who you were dealing with on the other side. Correct. I Isn't mean, that it was, amazing? It, it was on the basis of, of a level of trust. It's yeah. a heads of agreement. Can we move forward based on that? We agreed at board level what the heads of agreement would be. And that gave me the authority and the mandate to go into those discussions, which we did do. And it was never a question of, of selling the club, Joe. I think you understand that, OK? It's, it's a not-for-profit club, so the transfer is, is the classic euro, but it's on the understanding of investment. And that's what's critical here. OK, so who are these Canadians? OK, Tri- Tricor Pacific are an investment house, effectively, um, who obviously have done exceptionally well in the context of, of their world. They are involved in various elements of sport. Um, and, of course, Kieran McCormick needs no introduction. I mean, Kieran has been involved... At, at national and international level in terms of, of football and is well known from a Canadian perspective. And she created the introductions that were necessary here. And the group that actually have been formed, the Irish company, is Football Ventures Group, which Tricor are a partner in. And it's 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 that's the group that we've been dealing with and are moving forward with. So what, what we're looking at is people who genuinely understand what we're trying to achieve, who understand the nature and ethos of the club, and are prepared to work with that and move it forward on that basis. Uh, Mike Ahern, as I mentioned, <coughs> with uh, Con Murray and myself this morning. So, um, from the fans' perspective, and indeed for from the casual followers' mm. perspective, who wouldn't know the detail that Con and you know, Mike, what more can you tell us about Kira McCormick, who's been mentioned, 
about the Canadians and how you see this unrolling now? Well, I think it's look, it's a hugely positive development, isn't it, Joe? Because it means stability. And we haven't had that in Limerick soccer, not in my lifetime anyway, from down through the years, the different owners, the name changes, the financial troubles. And what Con has done is brought a huge stability to it. And we never went beyond our means. And that was hugely important over the last couple of years. So from a supporter's point of view, they've never had controversies to deal with. They've never had to wonder, will the club be there next season? They've been communicated with at all levels. They've been constantly kept up to date on any developments within the club. And for them, it's probably hugely exciting news because, as Con said, the key word here is investment. The current board brought it to a level where, you know, we were just keeping our heads above water. It was alive. There's no debts. There's no bad news stories. And now it's time for somebody to just kick it on kick it on that extra 5-10% and who knows where that will bring the club to. Kira McCormack has been around the club for a couple of years. She's not new. She's played with Treaty United. She's been involved in the senior management setup. She's very familiar with Mary Curtin, an international colleague of hers. Mary, of course, lives and is from Limerick, so she brings all that local knowledge to the setup as well. So it'll be a very unique setup. Kira becomes the first CEO, I suppose not in Irish football because Ruth Fahey was in charge of Galway women at the time, but they're now merged into just Galway. So they don't have a CEO that's female. So Kira will be the first co-owner and female within League of Ireland. And that will bring huge challenges for her, but also a new voice because it's all about, you know, bringing women now to the table getting representation on senior boards and so on. And this is a huge step for Treaty and for Irish soccer. Right. And Mike, I know from talking to you over the years and people who are familiar with the women's Treaty side will know there's quite a Canadian influence there, even on the playing staff. Could we see something similar on the men's side now? You'd have to think so, wouldn't you? Because Canada, I suppose, Joe, they're trying to get players into the American market. They're full up. I mean, there's no place for a really talented uh, Canadian girl to go into an American college now. The spaces are all taken up. We even have some Irish players that go over on scholarships, so on. So the Canadians had to look and think outside the box. So where's next after America coming across? It's Ireland. Great stop, great league. The league is improving, particularly from a female perspective. The Women's National League are growing all the time. Shelburne, Peamount, Shamrock Rovers, Wexford, they're all there competing at the top of the table. And Treaty this year have been so, so competitive. And it's because they were able to bring in some players of quality from Canada. Goalkeeper is there at the moment, Annie Oliak, fantastic goalkeeper, not conceding as many goals over the last couple of years, which means you don't lose games. So it's a win-win, isn't it? The Canadians get to bring some players who are going to see competitive football and probably bring their careers on, while Treaty can accommodate that because you're always looking for talent that will improve the team and improve the standard of the game. Right, and the new uh, co-owner... Um she even has a football school in Canada, doesn't she? Yeah, she is top sport and again, she's nurturing the talent. And I think when I spoke with Kira well over a year and a half ago about some of the Canadian players coming over to Ireland, that was her primary ambition to make sure that these rising stars in the Canadian game had somewhere to go. The Canadian game is in ruins, as you know, men's and women's soccer, full of scandal stories, abuse, all that going on in the background. The Canadian government haven't dealt with it. So the players are also thinking, well, how do I secure my future in a football point of view? They see this as a step to Ireland, possibly into the women's uh, Premier League in England, where, of course, you can earn a really good wage. Now, I mean, some players there are on quarter of a million a year, most of them hitting towards the 100,000 mark. You know, so that is a really good living. And Ireland has often been seen as the stepping stone to England. Con Murray then, um, you mentioned it was the classic Euro, as you said, because currently Treaty United is a not-for-profit and it is built on volunteerism. But that won't quite be the case with the new Treaty United, right? It will become a limited company. That's correct, Joe. In fact, it has uh, already. And in the last couple of weeks, that, that transfer or transition has taken place in the, in the, in the company registration office. And the, the group that are taking over with the new directors are dealing with a limited company. And what it is, it's bringing, it's, it's bringing executives to the table, which we would love to have had over the last couple of years, paid people actually carrying out the work instead of all the volunteerism. So you're looking at a professionalisation of the management and running of the club, as well as the football itself. And I think that's an important step forward. 
What about uh, the high profile manager, Tommy Barrett, very much respected in Limerick and in football around the country? What about the current players of Treat United FC? What's going to happen to them? Well, as I said, the, the, the players have been extraordinarily um, faithful to us uh, in terms of the commitment uh, and loyalty to the club. Uh, Tommy has equally been so and has worked and I've said this publicly on a shoestring for quite a number of years, but has brought extraordinary uh, success uh, to the club. And, and that has, uh, I suppose, reflected itself in our underage football as well, both, both men's and women's. And I would hope, genuinely, that that talent, that experience uh, will be sustained into the future. Um, I see absolutely no reason why it wouldn't be. The market field is where home matches are played. Will that continue? It will. There's no question about that. And that is the home of, of League of Ireland soccer in the Midwest. And and certainly, I, I, I know there's been a lot of discussion, there's been a lot of things out there, but there was never a doubt as to where we would be playing as Treaty United. And in my view, there should never be a doubt as to where the future of, of League of Ireland soccer is played. So, because the club was not bought with significant cash, but there were understandings around investment... Uh, particularly from this Canadian group, do we have any sense of budgets? Um, I, I, I suppose, Joe, it's a matter for them to make their appropriate announcements and, and, and I will respect that. But as part and parcel of the deal, it's written into the contracts of, 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 of the, the transfer that there will be a significant investment in the club. So I, I would leave it to them to make that in fairness. Um, but I was very satisfied at the, the type of commitment the type of monies that will be brought to it. And also, I suppose, it's very important to point out the approach. This is not going to change overnight to... to um, we're not going to be Dundalk. We're not going to be even Drada, should I say that at this point in time. But there will be a steady build-up of the club and they will respect what we said from the start. This is a future that must be sustained, not rushed. And, and I believe that they will pick up on that. But ultimately, there's ambition there. In other words, they're in the first division at the moment. We know Tommy Barrett and the players have frankly worked miracles over the last couple of years to be in contention to go up to the Premier Division. So that must be part of the plan and then to be sustainable in the Premier Division. Absolutely. I mean, Joe, that's why I suppose the board made the decision to take this next step. Because while we have brought it, we have created a platform uh, we we knew that this needs needs to be launched, and the only way for that is is a next move forward, and investment is what was required. And as a not for profit, we and I, I think it's important to point we started every year with nothing. We had to actually provide the six hundred and fifty thousand that was necessary to, for the club to survive. And I think, as I said quite recently, our first game out, Joe Marketsfield, I bought the goals. We hadn't even got goalposts to actually put up in the Marketsfield. So there's where we started, but where we are is a very successful club. We have underage academy, a top-notch underage academy with coaches who are professional and an extraordinary level of support from the community. No issues, presumably, with the FAI licensing, anything like that, because, you know, there are fit and proper tests that people will know who watch football as to someone taking over. Yeah, the due diligence has been going on for quite a number of months. Um, to be honest, Joe, I would, like, I would love to have have completed this much earlier, but we are at the end of the season. The due diligence on all sides, and I'll put that, has been has been clarified. Uh, the FAI have been fully uh, aware of what we are doing. The licensing process is ongoing for the 2024, so that, that we, we've done everything that is normal in the context of applying for that licence. So there are no issues on that side. Now, there is one aspect to this, Con, and it's one of the reasons I believe that you have looked at this investment. It has been difficult to get financial backing for Treaty United FC in Limerick and the region. That's a fact, isn't it? It, it, it is, Joe, but, but we have to reflect on the history too. I mean, soccer did, we did take a huge dip here in this part of the country and we had to rebuild the trust with the community with the creditors that are out there. And, and from the very outset, we had to put money up front in order to create that trust. And we have done that. So we have, we've re rebuilt, if you like, that, that relationship that's critical to understand where treaty can go. And we have been enormously grateful to those people who have stood up and supported us over the last four seasons. And I would hope with this type of commitment and trust in what we have done, more people will come on board.
Right. Look, Michael Hearn, you're involved in soccer a long time in Limerick and I know you always try and look at this from the fans' perspective. So the Canadians may not bring quite the level of razzmatazz that the Americans do, two different countries, obviously, but they bring a certain amount. So what can the fans expect from the new Treaty United FC? Well, they can expect a fresh approach, can't they? A fresh set of eyes. They're obviously in the acquisitions and mergers business, so they wouldn't have done this just for the first time now. So they'll know the run of the mill, the business, how to improve. They have a big marketing team behind them. So they will come with a lot of power and artillery, as they say, in the background. It has to translate, though, to bums on seats in the stadium. It's the only way to bring revenue into the club. So for them, they'll know it'll need competitive teams on the pitch. To have competitive teams on the pitch, you need to improve from an amateur status, probably to part-time or even full-time. Tommy Barrett is, as you correctly said, working miracles. You have at Lone, Wexford, Cove, all these teams improved this year off the pitch, most of them full-time. Finn Harps full-time, finishing in around them and above them. Incredible to think they're training, well, 30 hours a week. Tommy has the lads five hours at the most. And he's lucky if they can even travel two nights a week. You might get the Dublin lads down once a week. So certainly there, he'll need more contact time with the players. And that's the first thing I'd be looking at. And even from the women's point of view, such an open window. If you win the National League to get into the European Champions League in women's soccer, which is absolutely huge, 80,000 in some stadiums, 60, 70,000 at finals. Big opportunity there to strengthen the women's game. But for the fans, they'll sit back now. They'll take stock. They'll see it as exciting but they will only react when the new signings are announced, the next season comes about, have we improved, is there a better standard of player, are we going to win the first division? That excitement came with the previous owners at Limerick FC where we maintained the Premier League budget when we were relegated. Next season we knew we were getting promoted. It brings a huge amount of excitement, Joe, to supporters. But I think for now, they'll sit back, they'll take stock and they'll only measure the new incoming board and owners by their actions. Right. Um, And obviously the regional dimension too, you know, Treaty United has tried to spread across the Midwest. Yeah, it's been huge for us. I mean, the interest from Nina, Ennis, Six Mile Bridge, places like that. I mean, we obviously review our ticket sales and we know where people are buying tickets from, particularly online. And would you believe it's almost a 50-50 split with Limerick and outside of Limerick in terms of North Tipperary and Clare. We've supporters coming from West Limerick and even into Kerry. So we have definitely expanded the supporter base. I think the average, you know, back in the Limerick FC days was in around 350-400. We've certainly almost doubled that now in terms of an average gate so that alone means But the new club will need more won't they they, they need higher gates on a consistent basis Yeah you see it John the Premier Division like the likes of Shamrock Rovers Bohemians they're setting out their stadiums every week now they're able then to plough that back into the team provide full time football if that isn't the ambition for the new owners we're just going to be back in the stagnated position in two years' time. And the thing is, Con, I mean, you have experience, I know, in another life of places like Louth, you know, where which is a football hotbed. And you look at Limerick and you look at our population and think, we should be able to see gates of two and a half, three thousand on a reasonably sustained basis for a senior football club here. Oh, there's no doubt about that, Joe. I mean, I've looked and worked with Drahada and Dundalk and have experienced what a derby looks like in, in, in that part of the world. And I, I wouldn't have understood, I'll be honest, the, the, the lack of, of bums and seats, as, as Mike puts it there. When we were successful, when we were doing well, when it was getting exciting, heading for an FAI um, semi-final, we were, we were getting 3,000 plus in the stadium itself. So I think what Mike is saying, if, you have, if you're competitive, if you are actually challenging at the highest levels, people will come. The most heartening thing, Joe, in the last couple of years is the amount of young people walking around the streets with treaty jerseys on. Mm-hmm. I don't think we, we, we'd, we'd have thought that would have happened. And it's fantastic to see. And it will. Con- I think that's we're the start of something very important, right. very exciting. Right, well, listen, thank you both very much for everything you've done for football. Mike Hearn obviously remains very much involved with Live 95 as our soccer correspondent. Uh, Con, for you, are, are you and the others stepping away and just becoming fans of Treaty United? Well, we'll always be a fan of Treaty United. I'm certainly stepping away at this point in time. We've, we've, we've made the commitment to this date. I hope uh, that others will be remaining uh, because their experience um, would be absolutely critical in terms of going forward. And in my view, it'd be very foolish to ignore that in terms of, of, of the transition process that is critically important here and now. I want to 
if you, if you would mind, Joe. First of all, just just thank yourselves in, in Life 95 for the level of support that we've had over the last four seasons. It has been incredible, led in many cases by Mike, but he's been a huge and enormous support to me and the board in, in, in that period as well. But also to, to the board members um, who, who probably are not known to most people out there, but their time and commitment has been extraordinary. And it has, from day one, been volunteered. And... And, and that is reflected on all of those people who have worked with Treaty United for the last four seasons. And I want to extend an enormous thank you to everybody who actually put that shoulder to the wheel, brought us to where we are. And I hope, genuinely, that will not be forgotten. All right. Well, thank you, Con Murray. I know this was a labour of love for you because you're a busy man with other things that you're doing as well. Um, and finally, Mike, when can we expect to hear then from the new owners? Yeah, so they've released a statement this morning. I know Gillian uh, dealt with it there in the news and there'll be plenty more on Live 95 throughout the day. So we will hear from them officially at the start of next week. I know they're arranging a press conference with the local media and then familiarity with the new faces that will be involved in the club. You'll certainly be hearing from the new incoming CEO, uh, Kira McCormack, and then you'd imagine more of the Tricor Pacific group will then emerge and certainly the, the new look board, I suppose, will also be unveiled. But certainly, I think in the coming days, Joe, they've really put the shoulder to the wheel with informing the volunteers, the members, the current playing staff and prioritising them with the key messaging because they will stabilise the club in the coming days. And of course, we've Saturday to look forward to. The playoff race isn't over yet, so it could become a hugely exciting five or six days. But definitely from a new board perspective, you will hear from them at the start of next week when they have an official press conference.